Welcome, uh, everyone, to the um, Audit Committee of the Sioux Falls City Council. Today's Wednesday, the 11th of uh, October, 11-11. Oh, that's not 11-11, it's 10-11. And um, we um, uh, are happy to have everyone here. Um, we have a couple people missing, uh, but uh, they will maybe show up uh, as we get going. Um, first thing I'd like to do is make some, uh, do some recognition. Um, Seth Peterson has been with us for three years. He has decided not to re-up at this point. Maybe we'll catch him late, a little later on in his career too. But um, he's the Assistant Vice President and Internal Auditing Manager for uh, First National Bank. Uh, he's had, like I said, three years on the audit committee, been a very valuable person in the, in the committee, uh, helped with a lot of different things. And uh, we really, we're gonna miss you, but uh, we're happy to have you here today in your last meeting. And I would like to present to you a plaque or a and the other good thing we have going on not that that's that wasn't really that good but uh, you know <laughs> But uh, we do have our new um, audit committee chair, or audit committee person, uh, Rose Grant, uh, here with us today. So thank you for uh, thank you for accepting the uh, invitation to be part of this uh, committee. Um, she was appointed by City Council on September 23rd, so um, she's replacing. She'll be replacing uh, Seth. Uh, she's president and owner of Grant and Williams Inc., which is an accounting firm here in town, and uh, she has some very good auditing experience along with. Uh, uh, 32 years of public accounting experience. So we've got, uh, we've got another good one. So thank you, appreciate it. Look forward to working with you. Um, I would ask for approval of minutes for the meeting of June 29th, 2017. Second. Uh, and a second. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, audit reports updates. Uh, Kim. Our first audit report would be the audit report 17-02 on cable TV and OVS fees. Um, this was an audit that looked at the, sorry, will it have me get caught up? <laughs> um, this audit looked at the fee revenue received by the city from the franchise fee and OVS license agreements. Um, agreements currently exist with Midco as well as Vast Broadband. The agreement with Midco is a 10-year franchise agreement, which will expire December of 2019. And the agreement with BAST is an OVS license agreement that originally was entered into between the city and Nology in 2005, um, which has since been transferred through various acquisitions. It is in its last renewal period and will also end December of 2019. The city collects approximately 950,000 to a million dollars excuse me, in revenue from franchise and OVS fees per year. These fees are self-reported and remitted to the city on a monthly basis. Monthly remittals are reviewed by multimedia services staff for reasonableness and any unanticipated fluctuations are researched. The last audit of the cable franchise and OVS fee revenue was performed in 2009. The objectives of the audit were to determine if the cable television fees and OVS license fees were properly calculated and paid on time, to ensure compliance with various insurance requirements of the agreements, and to determine if the city has established and sufficiently defined roles and responsibilities to administer the agreements. Our audit period covered the years of 2014 through 2016. From that period, we selected six months of fee remittances, sorry, and traced the amount paid to the city back to the detailed support schedules. We found that the remittals were properly supported and paid on time. Um, we also tested individual customer invoices and recalculated the franchise fees for those customers for the same six months. We found that franchise and OVS fees were properly calculated with the following exception. Uh, Midco had identified a period from January of 2011 through May of 2015 when the franchise fee was calculated at 2% instead of 2.5% on one line item of the customer statements. Um, what caused this is in 2011, 
Local broadcast networks began charging a retransmission fee to give the cable providers consent to retransmit their signals to customers. Um, the retransmission fee is then passed through to the customers on the monthly billing invoices. And when Midco updated their billing schedules to include the retransmission fee, the rate for the franchise fee on it's a fee on a fee, basically. The rate for the franchise fee was incorrectly set to only the 2% franchise fee and the half a percent portion that was designated as the community grant that comes into the city was not included. Um, this miscalculation was not initially discovered in Midco's annual rate review because the variance on an individual customer invoice ranged somewhere between half a cent and two cents. It was thought or assumed to be a rounding issue. Um, as that retransmission fee grew over the years, the variance grew um, approximately three cents per customer invoice per month, which was then caught in the rate review and corrected by Midco. So they've provided an estimate of uncollected fees due to the miscalculation, which is recapped on page four of the report. And we've broken that into two sections. Um, the top graph shows uncollected fees for January 2014 through May 2015. And the bottom graph shows estimated uncollected fees for the period when this started, 2011 through 2013. The reason for us breaking those into the two periods is because ordinance defines the limitation of recovery as a three-year period. So as a result of this, um, we've made the following recommendation, which is on page five of the report. We recommend that Midco remit the amount of uncollected franchise fees within the recovery period um, in the amount of $12,046.48, and that these fees are to be remitted prior to December 31st. Management um, concurs with this and will remit the payment. As part of the audit, we also reviewed insurance coverages for both providers, noting proper documentation was on file with the city and proper coverage levels are in place. Um, we also reviewed contract moder monitoring. Um, just as a note, the city does not currently have a centralized process for contract monitoring. It's done at the department level and based on the individual requirements of the contract. The franchise and OVS agreements are managed by multimedia support um, with the assistance of finance, the city's legal team, and internal audit departments as needed. And we did make the following recommendation regarding contract compliance monitoring. We recommended that management work together with internal audit to develop a plan for routine rev review of revenue received from the cable TV and OVS franchise agreements. Management agreed with this recommendation and we have scheduled an initial meeting to take place later this month. So with that, I think we will open it up to questions. Questions from the committee. Got it. Yeah, uh, Kim, could uh, could you clarify so that second period, uh, the earlier period, 2011 to 2013, um, that was uh, an estimate of the uncollected. So that 13,000, um, does that get collected as well? It will not. That is revenue that was not collected by Midco, and therefore not remitted to the city as well, it wasn't passed on to the customer. Um, the other 12,000 that we will be collecting is coming out of Midco's pocket because they did not bill the customer for that either. That's the statute of limitations. Oh, right, the statute. because of the statute, yep. Okay. And now we would sure accept that <coughs> if they would pay it. And that, uh, and they had, um, they had determined um, the error prior to your arrival Correct. Okay, and, and so that was, the wheels were in motion already to, to correct that and repay, or to, I assume. Right, and um, management from Midco is here, but I believe it was caught in May of 2015, which is when, it, or in that period in spring of 2015, it was corrected on the May or June billings. Thanks. Yep. Other questions? So when they identified it in May 2015, kind of what's the, the reason for the lag? So I mean, we're at October 2017, like 
quite a bit of time has passed in between there, so when they identified it, was there not a look back at that time? It was identified internally by them. We hadn't performed an audit during that period, so I don't know that we have any requirements for them to report it. We would, we can ask Dan to speak to that too if you want. Dan's here oh. from Midco. Um, Sue wasn't able to be here. Okay, Dan, would you like to comment on that? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee staff. Dan Nelson representing Midco. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address this. Um, the people that identified it identified it as an IT error. And again, they, their job is to identify those information technology errors and make correction. Our error at that point, not realizing that it was a larger policy issue, but again, internally, it was viewed as rounding. If you, so we're talking about a fraction of the fee that's charged, 20% of the total fee that's charged, against the fraction of the total revenue that a video customer pays because the retransmission fee is set out separately. One point of clarification. We chose to set that out separately. The broadcasters don't require it to be set out separately. It's our methodology to show customers what that local broadcast portion of their service actually costs. And as you see in 2011 when it was established, it was 66 cents and it's steadily gone up. That's a lament. It's, it's a lament of the uh, cable industry that those costs continue to drive costs that we have to pass through to our customers. But um, again, it wasn't viewed properly by us. That's our error. Um, but it was fixed. And that, um, as the audit report shows, again, we're aware that overall revenue was generally increasing, all that kind of stuff. And we didn't look at it correctly to say this is something that should be fixed. The other thing that hasn't been touched on, the reason there's 2% and 0.5% is because the city takes that half percent and passes that through onto the school district uh, for support of Kaler. We pay it, but it's passed right through. When that split fee was set up after the last renewal, it was at the city's request that we administered them separately. Again, not by way of excuse, but explanation. That built a little more complexity into the system setting the table for this slight fractional error that we made. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, one last point. Um, and we are remitting under the specified in the ordinance, the three-year uh, recovery period. Um, by federal directive, we would be able to charge that to a customer now um, and inform them that this was an underpayment of a fee previously to the city and we're charging it to you now and we've chosen not to do that and under the audit period uh, bring forward the, the remittance. Okay, other questions? Then thank you for your thank you. explanation and we appreciate your willingness to uh, work with them. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would entertain a motion to submit the report to the mayor and the city council for approval. Have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Ashley. Okay. The accounts payable audit was included on the 2017 annual audit plan as a carry for forward audit from 2016. The purpose of the audit was to review the accounts payable system and current procedures to ensure internal controls are in place and functioning. We focused on the areas of vendor management, invoice handling, and the reconciliation process. This audit does not include a review of the purchasing process and also excludes purchases made using city credit cards as those areas are addressed in separate audits. The city's accounts payable process is centralized within the accounting division of the finance department. The AP staff are responsible for processing invoices for payment, vendor management, check printing, um, making sure expenditures are recorded properly, 
and providing assurance that all payments made by the city are financially accurate. The finance department has about four FTEs dedicated to the centralized payment function. The table on page two shows how many invoices are processed by the AP staff on a yearly basis and the total dollar amount of those invoices. So for example, um, in 2016, they processed approximately 29,000 invoices, totaling about $185 million. The AP process begins at the department level. Staff will create an electronic requisition in Munis in order to request the goods or services they would like to purchase for their department. The requisition is converted to a purchase order by the purchasing division and then sent to the vendor. The vendors that the city does business with are all maintained within the master vendor file in Munis by the AP staff. All vendors must submit a W-9 before the city conduct, can conduct business with them. Um, when an invoice is for the goods or services purchased by the city is received, it's um, scanned into Munis, compared with the purchase order, and entered into the system. Prior to payment, all invoices must be reviewed and approved by the department manager or finance. Once they're approved, an AP, AP clerk can process the invoice, which posts the debit to the corresponding expense account. Invoices approved and processed will advance to the weekly check run or the EFT process. Prior to the release of checks and EFT payments, a listing of all the disbursements are sent to the finance director, director and mayor for signature approval. The chart on page three is a summary of how many checks and EFT payments are made and the percent of total, total dollar value they amount to. Um, that kind of paints an interesting picture because it shows that pretty much checks and EFT payments make up about half and half the payments, but majority of payments, the dollar amount is way higher for EFT payments, about 81%, 80 and checks are about 20%. Um, the four objectives of this audit were to determine if adequate controls exist over the process of vendor setup, maintenance, and validation, to determine if adequate controls are in place to ensure payments are mathematically accurate, properly supported, authorized, and remitted timely, to determine if ad adequate controls are in place to prevent duplicate payments to vendors, and to determine if accurate and timely reconciliation is prepared between the accounts payable bank account and general ledger. The scope of the audit included a review of the current vendor listing, system access, and policies and procedures. The detailed testing of transactions covered the 12-month period of June 2016 to May 2017. Our audit work included interviews with AP management and staff. Uh, we reviewed the master vendor file for duplicate vendors and proper maintenance. We reviewed system access to the master vendor file, performed analytical reviews of the vendor payment history report. Um, we reviewed a sample of vendor files and performed detailed testing of a sample of invoices processed. And we reviewed all invoices greater than 500 for duplicate payments and also reviewed a sample of monthly reconciliations. For the results of the audit, we basically determined that objectives two, three, and four are being satisfied. Um, I'll discuss those first. So if you skip ahead to the middle of page five, under invoice handling and duplicate payments, um, we determined that controls are in place to ensure payments are mathematically accurate, properly supported, authorized, and remitted timely. And we also did not identify any duplicate payments, which provides assurance that proper controls are in place to prevent duplicate payments to vendors. And then on the top of page six, we determined that reconciliations between the accounts payable bank account and general ledger are materially accurate and properly completed e each month. We also noted that each monthly recon is sent to management for the review and sign off. And then back to page four, under vendor management, uh, we did determine that there are various controls in place over the process of vendor setup, maintenance, and validation, 
However, we noted two audit findings, which are shown on the top of page five. For audit finding one, uh, we reviewed the master vendor file and determined that there are duplicate vendors, vendors with identical addresses, vendors with no activity during the last three years, and vendor names that are not in agreement with the master vendor file naming convention policy. We also determined that the master vendor file has not been thoroughly reviewed since the implementation of Munis in 2014. Best practices, best practices suggest uh, keeping the vendor file free from inactive vendors and erroneous data by regularly reviewing the file on at least an annual basis. A clean vendor file will decrease the opportunity for errors and fraud and increase user efficiency. So we included recommendation one to address this finding, and I'll discuss that in a moment. Uh, for audit finding two, we reviewed access rights to the master vendor file and to the various roles within Munis, and we noted nine employees within the finance department currently have access to create a new vendor, enter invoices and print checks, and 15 employees within the finance department cur currently have access to enter invoices and print checks. Um, even though there are mitigating controls, unnecessary access to those particular activities create an opportunity for fraud or misappropriation of assets. And we included recommendation two to address that finding. So to the recommendations on page six, um, for recommendation one, we recommend that management ensure the accounts payable policy and master vendor file naming convention policy are consistently followed. The AP policy does state that the master vendor file will be reviewed on an annual basis and all vendors not used within the last three years will be inactivated. The policy also states that the process by which vendor names are entered in the master vendor file will be standardized. Vendors with no payment activity for a specified period of time should be inactivated. Also, duplicate vendor records should be corrected and the accuracy of vendor information should be verified. Management stated that they will complete a cleanup of the master vendor file and will continue to perform the cleanup process in December of each year going forward. They also stated that staff will continue to reference the master vendor file naming convention policy for the addition of all new vendors. For recommendation two, we recommend that management ensure proper segregation of duties exists by requesting that those with unnecessary access to various accounts payable activities in Munis are deactivated. Management agrees that it would be preferable to have fewer users with access to multiple roles. However, software limitations and efficient operations require certain individuals to have multiple role access. Uh, in order to reduce the risk of any loss, management will be adding an independent monthly review of all finance employee role changes. On the next page, page seven, um, we did identify an opportunity for improvement to the accounts payable process, which is uh, that management should establish a standard, standardized invoice coding process for all invoices entered for payment. Oftentimes, um, the staff receive invoices without invoice numbers, and so they assign a random number to the invoice. If the invoice is entered a second time and formatted different from the original entry, the system would allow payment of both invoices. They do have in their policy that invoices will be standardized when entering them into Munis, and it does appear that they have attempted to enter them in a consistent manner. However, with no formal written policy to outline the formatting rules, it makes it difficult to remain consistent and the risk of an invoice being paid twice increases. Um, in conclusion, we believe there are adequate controls over the accounts payable process administered by the city's finance department. We noticed that with the implementation of Munis, additional controls are now in place since the prior audit in 2008. Uh, AP staff are processing payables timely we did not identify duplicate payments or unusual activity, and we do not have reason to believe fraud exists. The recommendations we suggested are based on industry best practices and will provide additional assurances through increased risk mitigation designed to prevent errors and fraud. 
and we thank the finance department staff for their cooperation and assistance provided during the audit. Super, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> questions? I have one. Dean? So, um, so it's a good report. Um, it, did they, uh, with, with the number of people that have access to uh, enter invoices and, and checks, um, 15, being 15 uh, for one group, did, are, are they going to reduce that number at all? Um, they are actually going to roll out, um, I don't know if you can answer Tom, this, Tom. Would you Tom? like to help us? They're going to be making some changes to Munis. Good afternoon, Tom Huber with the Finance Office. Uh, obviously, the fewer people that would have access to that, the better. In the case of our, of our software system, though, as we go through upgrades and troubleshooting and fixes, uh, role access to be able to change user roles is kind of the critical piece. And um, so we've asked, or we are planning to take it forward again to our software company to put our approval process that would be available to change role access so people could change role accesses in order to properly test the software and resolve departmental issues and, and work through various uh, components as, as we process uh, the, all the financial transactions, uh, it doesn't exist today. It would be an intuitive enhancement that we think would be good for the software. So uh, we can limit to a, to a point, but uh, we have a lot of different people with a lot of different roles from payroll, accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, fixed assets, and it's those ability to change roles. We don't have that many people involved in the accounts payable process, but that ability to change roles is the hang up. And so we are gonna put another step in the process that would, uh, we already review the vendor master files so that any changes to vendors are reviewed on a monthly basis by an independent uh, manager. What we're going to add to that, any changes to roles is going to be independently re reviewed and documented as well. Uh, in addition, we'll keep pushing for that, uh, hopefully that role to have a secondary approval process to change roles. And uh, we will be looking at the number of these. Some of these, I believe, are also in IT because IT establishes the initial user and also adds them to Active Directory, so they have to have access to some of that. Again, they're not involved in the accounts payable process, but they can make changes to give themselves access to various different uh, components. And so um, all those together to try to, as, as Ashley pointed to, mitigate the risk as much as possible, but not slow down the efficiency of being able to troubleshoot the software, take care of the upgrades as they come through, and, uh, and assist the departments in, in uh, uh, keep processing the, the claims efficiently. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think the key is that, you know, it is, it is a little bit of a risk area and, and a, a light's been shined on it. And so as opportunity presents itself to, you know, increase the control over that, um, I think that's an important thing to do. We certainly concur. And like I said, we're gonna take it up with the software vendor again, because we think others would have this issue as well that uh, you should have some approval process over role changes. It's, it's something that we think uh, should be a part of it. But there might be a bigger programming issue for them, so. Thanks. The other thing that I, I don't know, suggest or look at, um, Kim, is the idea that uh, it's been since 2009 since we've done an audit of this. I'm wondering if that uh, shouldn't be a little more every nine, 10 years is maybe not quite enough with the, with the amount of money that's going through there? Or do you have a comment, Tom? No problem. Yeah, um, you can go ahead, Tom, and then I'll speak. <laughs> well, that's something that we, we do would like. It's kind of a continuous. We do it some with procurement, and we've worked with the audit team, and they've been very accommodating to do a little more frequent roll through uh, an audit of, of some of these areas. and. And we certainly welcome that because it, it does ensure that things are being properly handled. Again, thoroughness and accuracy are job number one when it comes to making sure that uh, we do this correctly. So we appreciate that support. Ashley, you wanted to comment oh, that on was that? That was fine. it? Yep. Okay. 
Question, question for you, Tom. Um, so I'm re in the second part of the audit finding, 15 employees currently have access to enter invoices and print checks. How, how does that relate to these roles you're talking about? Do multiple roles have the ability to Correct. Do yeah, that? And well, not only that, but you could give yourself different roles. So if you can go in and, and work within the roles uh, uh, part of the software, you could give yourself the role to do accounts payable. It's not that they all do it, it's not that they all have it, but it's that they have the ability to give themselves that role. Well, that would be caught on any audit check, uh, you know, that we're gonna implement now with having a check on changes of roles. But again, it's that ability to do it in the first place. Sounds like, sounds like if I could just go in and make myself a domain administrator, that sounds, it's surprising that. It is actually the, there are a few people that have the IT system admin role. Mm -hmm. There are a few yeah. employees in the finance department that have that role. Okay. And so they can assign themselves access to this and access to that or a role to this, a role to that. But the actual AP staff, they're the only ones that technically have the AP role. Do you know what I mean? And so it's those um, system admin roles that need to be reviewed on a monthly basis. So it's just those two that could... Yeah, the two roles. Okay, so not any user can go in and just make Correct. themselves oh, no. to no. write checks. Right, oh, no. okay. there's just those two roles. But, but so the review would be to check to see if any, anybody else has been added in as an administrator Correct. more or less. Yep. Okay. Right. Again, we think there'd be other things in the software that could catch those things instead of having to do a constant audit of that, but uh, we believe that it, uh, that certainly mitigates it. To, to a large extent, but it's not ideal. And we want to improve it and we'll keep working to. It would seem like asking the vendor if there's a way to do, you know, if they could add a, some sort of feature where there'd be some sort of, you know, whether it be an email or some sort of thing that would get sent out, you know, you know there's been a new addition of. Right, and that's kind of what our recommendation was, is that just would allow an approval would, would work too, is to, if you did change your change a role that an approval was needed to do that, and we'd like that all the way around for any piece of the software. Uh, but yeah, in addition, there's just that notification, somebody did change their role, especially if it came to changing a role in a critical area like accounts, you know, printing checks or something like that, that that could pop up and, you know, it might even be something that long-term down the road, we look at paying for and saying, hey, we think this enhancement is critical and, and we're gonna push that forward and, and actually uh, work with the vendor to actually program it in. Okay, thanks. And I believe they're adding a workflow approval process to the check printing. So right now, there's not a secondary approval when the checks are printed, but there will be. I believe that was coming out in October. Is it would come out with the next upgrade. Uh, we don't know if we're gonna upgrade this fall yet or not, because there's some other uh, system issues that we have to make sure are addressed by, by the by Manus first. But uh, with the next upgrade, there is that uh, dual role where check writing is a totally separate role, which is a nice feature. Mm, so sorry. they're working towards it. We're working towards it. Further questions? Yes, Seth. Um, for the opportunity for improvement, we didn't uh, ask for management response for that, but we do say it um, increases the, the risk of duplicate payments. So do we feel that management is going to address that or is this just something we're okay if, if no action is taken? Um, we didn't really see that as, because we did not identify any duplicate payments and they are going to create a policy with this and move forward. They did like this idea of standard, standardized invoice coding, um, but we didn't see it as a huge risk just because we currently haven't identified any duplicate payments, and the system should catch that. We, Thank you. If I might, um, we do agree with that, though, and do plan to uh, put that policy in place. Uh, we have had some turnover in the AP staff. A couple of people, one person has left, and a part-timer left. And so we've uh, tried to strengthen that area a little bit, but, uh, and, and also kind of enforce this with the team to say, hey, it's important that we, that we get this done right. Thanks. And then with the amount of the dollar volume of checks that you go through the system, can you kind of touch on some of the fraud prevention controls you have in place? Do you use positive pay or anything like that? Uh, 
First of all, our number one control is to send the money via EFT. Anytime we can, you can see that by, by far and away, a majority of our payments are going out via electronic payment, which is the most safe and secure way we can transmit. Um, we also have uh, uh, several different control points for, for the check process and approval process. Uh, we do not use positive pay at this time. Uh, for our, our bank uh, really doesn't push that part of it. It's, uh, um, there's just so many other controls that we can use. Uh, long term, we just, as the, you'll notice the number goes down and down and down, and a lot of these are small uh, utility rebate checks and those type of things uh, that are actually going out via check. Uh, long term, we're looking for options to slowly go the same, similar way that we've went with uh, with uh, employee payroll, and that is direct deposit, uh, almost exclusively uh, direct payment. Thank you. Any other comments? I want to thank you for uh, both of you for being um, being with us today and answering questions, and for um, uh, your willingness to work with us on this. I think it's uh, your department has always been that way. Uh, and so I uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll continue to work that way in the we future. We love the partnership we have with internal audits and, and the team. It, it, it really works well to have get that second review, and we appreciate it. Super. Super. Thank you. Good job, Kim. Or, Ashley. Okay. Uh, Kim, would you like to review of uh, audits in progress? Yeah, I'm just going to give a brief update on what we're doing here. Um, we do have Abby who has joined our team. She is working on the maintenance of administrative, administrative instructions audit, um, planning to complete on that. We've done some sampling of the, well, we gathered approximately 275 policies citywide for an update on that. So we're running a sample of those to review those and also looking um, at the city's executive orders as a process of that. Um, also, we've started planning for the preventative maintenance audit, and Ashley will start working on fee waivers now that accounts payable is wrapped up. And then I'm continuing to work on both the fraud risk analysis and financial condition analysis, and then following up on implementation of prior audit recommendations. So yeah. things are coming along. Questions for Kim on that? I'm staying busy. That's good. Um, Next on the agenda is uh, travel continuing education. Um, Kim and Ashley would like to go to a um, two seven, 2017 audit and assurance update. That's here in town, I believe, right? Right. That's um, provided free of charge by our external auditors, Ide Bailey. So it's a full day of CPE for both of us. Right. And then uh, Kim to the Mid America Intergovernmental Audit Forum. Is this the first or second time you've been to that? This would be the first. Um, previously, Rich would have went to that. This each is the year. one that Rich went to every year and and enjoyed enjoyed it and always came back with a, uh, an idea or two. What? No, no, it's in it's Kansas. It's in Kansas, City. so no. no. No, not in Kansas City. And typically, what that entails is um, seminars on performance auditing that are specific to governments and specifically for the Midwest region. So we have a lot of similar sized cities and. Um, CAEs there, are chief audit executives there to share ideas. Do we need to approve that as a, or do I just do that as chair? That's a really good question. Let's approve it as vote, a board. Yeah. Move to approve. We have, and a second. Um, thank you, because we all know continuing education, especially in this this type of situation, is uh, is is needed, and it's always better. So, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Next, we have a, um, a short discussion, or as long as we want, on um, the external audit. As you know, there was a little bit of, oh, I don't want to say angst, but there was a little bit of uh, uh, problem. Uh, some, some of the counselors thought there might be a little bit of a problem in, in re-upping with Ide Bailey this year um, and going for another three-year contract. And uh, what we ended up doing was um, bringing that down to a one-year contract. So they will be doing the 2018 um, audit or 17 audit for in 18, right? And um, we need to kind of, I'm kind of looking for direction from you because uh, the way I understand it, they've kind of left it in my hands as, as there as to whether we should do an RFP or re-up for another year or two um, before we did an RFP. 
Uh, I see Scott is here. Um, would you like to make some comments on, um, on that, um, what your feelings might be? Scott Rust, purchasing manager for the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, I, I really don't have any, um, any bias either way. I mean, I'm, I'm here to do a job, and that's to issue an RFP if you guys request one. So, again, um, it's really up to this committee if they decide to do that. The only request that I do have um, on behalf of the finance department is that we start the process early and, and in the event that we do have um, a different decision uh, made where we hire someone different than Ide Bailey, um, there's a, you know uh, obviously some training time that you would need there and we need a little bit more time than we normally have. But again, it's really your decision. I'm not gonna say either way, so. Yes, it's great. Excuse me. My main question would be if we were to put out an RFP for a, a 20, what would it be 20, an audit of 2018 that's yep. done in 2019, when would, the, when would the RFP need to go out and when would it need to be finished for you to be? Typically an RFP process runs about 90 days and I would like to start that probably as early as either late January, early February. Um, just to get, make sure that we have plenty of time to get the contract executed and, and negotiated um, so we can start right away with the pre-planning and everything like that with the finance department, so. Okay. Okay, Arnie, did you have a question? No? no but I, I was just wondering what, what were some of the, the thought process of framing this up by the counselors? Well, there were, there are some, some of the counselors who felt that uh, the last RFP we did was, I believe, uh, four or five years ago, and that it was uh, time, and I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, and... Um, I was thinking 2013, but I couldn't tell you for, with certainty. It was uh, maybe even before that, if I remember like 2011 or something, but um, we ended up receiving two proposals, um, um, McGladry and Ide Bailey, and um, really two qualified firms, uh, difference in really came down to price. Um, one we'd worked with and one we hadn't. And again, um, Ide Bailey's been with us forever. They do a great job. Uh, I think you could um, talk with Cody or, or Tom and they would say the same thing. They'd bring in different auditors all the time so we don't end up with the same one. I think they're a pretty good firm overall. Um, we did renew for another year, and they did give us pricing for additional years, and again, their price increases are very modest, and what I would say, um, within market. Yes, great. Just to reply, um, there were two issues that I think some counselors had uh, concern about. One was just simply the number of years since it had been put out, just we should put it out again just to see if we're getting the best deal. And there was also contact made to some of us by another auditor who expressed interest and in some disappointment that there wasn't an, an opportunity f for them to essentially bid on it. So that's, that's essentially, I think I'm, it's pretty fair of what their concerns were. Yeah. I personally, I think it's, it's probably time to put out an RFP and, uh, and look at it. Uh, we did, I believe the last one we did with, uh, with uh, Ide Bailey was a three year deal with an with a option to renew for three mm -hmm. more years. Correct. And uh, so we end up with six years and, and now we're in kind of the seventh year, I believe, or something like that. And so, um, yeah, I, it's, it's probably time. Is, am I hearing a consensus from everyone that it's probably time to do that? Yeah. I'm definitely for it, but just is there a ballpark of how much it would cost to do an RFP? Is uh, it's much a, cost it, involved in that? It, there's not a lot of cost in, involved in it. It's my my time, um, basically, is to, is to do it and then have an evaluation team. So obviously we would have a cross-section of people that would have to evaluate it also. Okay. So um, there's not there's typically... Their T tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees no. or anything? No, no, okay. it's not. It's all in-house, no. It's all oh, in-house, yes, yeah. yes, yes. You, you, uh, the the you taxpayers know? are paying me. I, I, it's, again, it's my job to do this sort of type of work, so. Okay, great. I just had a comment that a lot of the fee difference when we go out for RFP is the initial startup fee for the firm, a new firm coming in for their first year doing the audit. Typically would have an increased fee. We won't know that until we do the process. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to weigh in a lot of years in public accounting experience and with the city. Uh, I think that uh, there's pros and cons. I think it's I think it's a good thing to do periodically to to do an RFP. 
Um, there is a learning process. An audit is a continual thing. It's not, you know, just a one-year thing because you, uh, as you, as you come in as auditors, you gain experience um, this year that benefit your audit work the next year. So I just, I don't think it's a good idea to change a lot. Um, I would agree with that. Uh, working in the finance office for 13 years, I think I've, I, I've learned enough that that's not, not one thing you want to change very frequently. Right. There's efficiencies that build there's up, efficiencies I guess is what I'm trying up. to say. And there's also specialized uh, knowledge uh, for, this, for the audit of a, of a governmental entity that um, many firms uh, don't have that experience. But certainly the two that, that bid this last time did. And I, you know, I'm not sure of any others locally that, that would have that. Seth? Um, I would agree that it's, it's probably time to put that out, but I think we should also um, communicate out to the council members that um, voice their concern that this isn't a guarantee that I'd Bailey won't be doing it, that it will be invited to participate in the process, and there's a chance that um, we would select them. And I think it's also a chance to take a look at our, our charter as well, because I think some of the concerns that came up the last time I'd Bailey was here when we were talking about forensic auditing and all these things. So those really should be the, the decision of the audit committee to make, and it shouldn't be coming from the, the city council. They can provide their suggestions, but it really should be the, the audit committee that's gonna make that decision from um, input from the internal audit team. So um, that's my two cents on that piece of it. Well said, well said. Um, okay, I'm hearing a consensus. Do we, uh, I don't know whether we should vote on this or, yeah, I think it probably would. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to um, direct the audit committee and the city of Sioux Falls to do an RFP for auditing uh, the city's finances for the year 2018. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Go ahead. One question, is it just a one year? Shouldn't we beginning, consider I said uh, beginning in 18? Oh, so, so we, we'd be looking yeah, for like a three year. The will happen with, with okay. Scott on how long it is. Right. Good question. Okay. Super. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything else for the good of the organization? Yes, Counselor. Just to uh, tag off of what Seth had brought up, I, I, I think it might be a good idea to have something, you know, yearly where we just discuss it and and it may be something as simple as yep next year we still have I'd Bailey or okay the contracts coming up do we want to or whoever it should be or do we want to continue and just renew it or whatever and just have a placeholder so we don't end up with a case where we're at the 11th hour and then if there's any carping about we'd like to do one and we can't do one because we've waited too long yeah so maybe it needs to be so around the end of each year or something yeah. Yeah, it probably for the should next be. Year. It probably should be. Yeah, this this either the summer or the fall, fall meeting that we have. Um, I would suggest yeah. that yeah, we either do that third quarter or fourth quarter of each year. And that being said, I think we can go forward with the RFP process and write it as a as we did this year as a one year audit with the option. The city has the option to extend for years two and three, if we can get that done. That way, if there are any identified problems, we're not in a three or five year engagement. So we'll work with Scott on that. Yep. Okay, um, good suggestion. So you'll put that in the tickler so we do it uh, in the summer. Okay, any other, yes. Um, just wanted to say it's been an honor to serve on this committee for the last three years. Um, it's gone, gone very fast. I think we have a strong internal audit team in place and I think it's good to, to get some good eye, new eyes on the um, audit committee as well, which we've added two highly qualified people. So I think you're in good hands and as Rex, or I mean as, as you mentioned earlier, um, it doesn't disqualify me from, from rejoining the committee in the future. That's so. right. That's right. Super. Uh, all in favor of uh, adjourning? Aye. Opposed? You can just say two. I